This is a video that has been in the works for quite some time and I thought I would go ahead and do it. Let's talk about triage in obstetrics and gynecology. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at triage in obstetrics and gynecology. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Tell a friend to tell a friend we are doing videos on the channel. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. So I did post this question on my community tab the other week and I did get an overwhelming response from you guys. So you're on call and have four patients refer to you all at once. A G4 para 3 at term fully dilated with fetal distress. A 24 year old with a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. A 65 year old woman with CA cervix actively bleeding and a PG at 36 weeks with uterine rupture. The first question is whom do you see first and why? And what order will you attend to these patients? So how will you triage these patients? I know I got some comments from some of you that no, we're going to see all these patients. It's not like I'm working alone. But this is a practical scenario where you can actually get these four patients referred all at once to you, especially the obstetric side where you get different types of emergencies actually referred to you at once, especially if you're working in a rural setup. So it's just going to be you, probably another midwife, and a senior doctor. So your senior doctor will obviously be in theater. Then it will just be you and the midwife, and you will be the one who is deciding who's going to be attended to first and in what order will they go in to theater. So this, I do acknowledge that there are some institutions where we're going to be working more than one individual at the hospital. So this is just in a rural setup, for example. So remember that triage is pretty much the process where we're going to be determining the priority of a patient's treatment that is going to be based on the severity of their condition and not based on when they arrived to the place or the, where, the what number they are in the queue. Most people don't really understand this when they come to the hospital because you find out that the relatives to the patients that are relatively stable are the ones that are actually making a lot of noise while it's those that actually need the help immediately are not even making so much noise. So triage, you may get to the hospital and then if an emergency comes, they are going to attend to the emergency first. So when a woman who is or might be pregnant actually presents to a hospital or a healthcare facility, she's going to be of immediate concern and she must be given immediate priority through the triage. Of course, this shouldn't disadvantage others that are seriously affected, like the men and the older women that are seriously affected. As you've already seen in the previous question where we had an old woman that's 65, that's actively bleeding. So we do divide patients into three main categories. We have what is known as category one, which is the red the patients, then category two, which is the orange, and category three, which is the green. So the red are those that are going to immediately die. There's a risk of dying, and these are going to be requiring immediate resuscitation. If you don't do anything for these patients, they will definitely die. So generally, you want to offer treatment to these patients immediately. You don't want to waste time. When a patient actually comes in and it's a, a, a red color of the triage, you are going to stop everything that you're doing and you attend to that patient. Then for orange are those that are seriously ill or injured, and here they're going to need timely emergency management, and these are going to be urgently needing the treatment, and you can wait up to 15 minutes before you actually attend to these patients. Then those that are green, these are those that have conditions which can wait before further assessment and possible treatment. So these ones can actually wait even up to one hour before they actually receive the medical treatment. So remember that from the moment actually the patient arrives at the healthcare facility, you're going to have to make a decision on who needs to be resuscitated first, especially if they all come at once. In our instance here, we have a policy where referring facilities have to call beforehand such that we are alerted of the patients that we're going to receive and we can prepare for the patients that we're going to receive. So the decision is going to be made based on certain clinical signs that I will talk about very shortly. But once the patients actually arise, arrives, 
the most important thing that you want to do for this patient is checking your vital signs and also looking at the level of consciousness. That's why they're referred to as vital signs. So you want to check the respiratory rate, you want to check for the characteristics of the respiration, whether there is any wheezing, is there any strider or any recession that may predispose this woman to respiratory distress or may mean that this woman is in respiratory distress. You want to check your pulse rate and your volume in case this patient is in shock. You want to check your blood pressure and you want to check your temperature. Remember that, especially in pregnant women, if you see a low blood pressure, it means that this woman, it's in the late stages and this is a very dangerous sign. So you're actually going to be much more safer picking up the pulse because there will be changes in the pulse that will come much earlier than the drop in the BP. So you have to keep this in mind. The other thing that you're also going to be looking at is the level of consciousness. We can simply use a quick assessment, which we call the AVPU scale, A for alert, where they are able to talk to the patient, they're able to respond. They're not unconscious. P is when they respond to uh, pain, where if you there's any pain stimulation, then they can respond. V is when they respond to verbal stimuli, and then U is when they are unconscious and they don't respond to anything. Then when you see a patient that's heavily bleeding or a patient that's suspected to be bleeding, remember that bleeding is going to be defined, this heavy bleeding is going to be defined as a clean pad or a cloth that is going to become soaked within less than five minutes. So all the patients that have signs and symptoms of them placing them in an immediate category or a color red triage color or an urgent category or an orange triage color, these ones are going to be emergencies and they're going to be potential emergencies that need to undergo a structured approach of how you're going to attend to these emergencies. We do talk about some of these emergencies on the channel. So if you haven't yet subscribed, I don't know what you're waiting for, hit the subscribe button. So if there is an urgent referral from another healthcare facility or organization, then your patients must be seen immediately or urgently depending on the circumstances surrounding the patient. So we'll begin with the red color, the, if patients are grouped in red. What clinical signs are you going to look for on observation? What clinical signs are you going to look for on the history in the pregnant patients? We can use the ABC approach. Remember A for airway, B for breathing, C for circulation. So airway is anything that could possibly obstruct or even might be obstructing the uh, upper airway. So ask yourself these questions. Is this patient unconscious? Can this patient respond? A good way to actually see if a patient is stable is you want to talk to them. You want to ask them to get up. If they can stand, you want to ask them to stand. That's a very good way to judge if a patient is actually stable or not. Of course, coupled with your vital signs, and if you have laboratory investigations, your laboratory investigations. Ask yourself, is the patient fitting or have they fitted? That's if you're even receiving a patient from a referral center, you should ask these questions. Is there any major trauma to the face or to the head, including burns? And is there any severe strider or gurgling in the throat? All these are indicative of airway problems. Then you want to move on to your breathing. Are there any problems that are producing apnea, which is cessation of respirations, any severe respiratory distress, or any cyanosis? Is the patient not breathing? Are they gasping? Is there any cyanosis? Is the patient having difficulty breathing that they can't even speak? All these are going to mean that the patient is, should be classified as uh, a triage color red and they need immediate attention. Then you come to your circulation. Is there any problems that are causing cardiac arrest or anything that can lead to shock or heart failure? Is the patient heavily bleeding? Is there any heavy vaginal bleeding? Remember, heavy, soaking a pad or cloth heavily within five minutes, that's already an indication that this bleeding is heavy. Has the patient suffered any major trauma? Is the patient appearing shocked? Are they very pale? Can They can sit up, they have reduced level of consciousness, their vitals are, are crashing. Then your orange color, the symptoms and signs that you're going to be looking for in observation and history, again, we can use the ABC approach. So A for airway, is there any problem that can possibly obstruct this patient's airway in future. For example, any trauma to the face, the head or burns to this area, but the patient is conscious and they're able to speak. Have they ingested anything or accidental overdose of any drug that may alter the level of consciousness? Then your breathing are any problem that could possibly produce any respiratory difficulty. So is the patient having difficulty breathing such that they, they can speak, but there is no cyanosis, but you can visibly see that there is some difficulty breathing. And then circulation, if they're having any problems that might, unless if uh, rapidly treated, lead to shock or heart failure. For example, if they're having vaginal bleeding, which is heavy, but they haven't yet entered into shock. So they're able to stand or sit or they're able to speak normally. So remember that patients that have actually suffered major trauma and are not yet shocked may possibly have internal bleeding. So 
they may still be able to stand, they may still be able to sit, they may still be able to speak normally. And any burn that's covering more than 10% of the body should be classified as orange. Any patient that has fainted and has abdominal pain, this includes those that have possible ruptured ectopic pregnancy, but they're able to stand, they're able to sit, they're able to speak normally, meaning they're hemodynamically stable, these can be classified as orange. If the patient has passed any products of conception and is bleeding but is not in shock, then they're able to stand or they're able to sit or they're able to speak normally. These are going to be considered as patients in triage color orange. Those that have severe abdominal pain but they're not in shock, they're able to stand, they're able to sit, they're able to speak normally. These three things, very important for you to consider. As well as a patient that's extremely pale but they're not in shock, they have severe anemia for example and they're able to stand, sit and speak normally. And other things you want to consider, patients that may fall under the orange triage color include those that have possible severe preeclampsia or impending eclampsia. This uh, could be in the background of patients that come in with complaints of headaches or visual disturbances. Those that have severe dehydration, they are complaining of severe diarrhea or vomiting, or they are feeling very weak but they are not yet in shock, so they are able to stand, sit, or speak normally. You have to actually take note that these conditions have the ability to actually present as a red triage color. For example, a patient comes in from a facility and they're actively seizing. Already that's a red color. You have to attend to that patient immediately. Then it could be a possible complication of pregnancy. So there may be abdominal pain that's not due to uterine contractions of labor. It could be possible premature labor where the patient is not yet due to deliver but they have ruptured membranes with or without contractions. It could be some infections that might become dangerous where they have a high fever greater than 38. So their body may be febrile to touch, they may be shivering, but they're able to stand or sit and speak normally. And it could be a possible intrauterine death, possibly after 24 weeks of pregnancy and the patient has not felt fetal movements for 24 hours or more. Or it could be a prolapsed cord where the patient says that the membranes have ruptured and she can actually feel this umbilical cord. So there are some special cases that we want to, to have special attention to. For example, hemorrhage. If a patient is at risk of exangiating, you want to put them in a red triage color. And of course, if a hemorrhage that is not rapidly controlled by applying any sustained pressure and it continues to bleed heavily or to soak uh, through the large dressings very quickly, then these ones should be treated immediately because there's a risk of this patient's dying. For the unconscious level, those that are either unresponsive or they are only responding to pain, these ones are going to be given a red triage color. And patients with a history of unconsciousness or fitting, uh, further dangerous events are possible. So these ones are going to be given an orange color together with those that can respond to verbal stimuli. And in terms of pain, these are going to be patients that are in severe pain are going to be given a red color and those that have lesser degrees of pain given an orange color. But of course, pain is a very subjective thing. It's not something that you can objectify. It's very subjective and generally based on the pain threshold of that particular individual. So for the patients who have sustained significant trauma or other surgical problems that are anesthetic related, surgical help and anesthesia help can actually be well, gotten from immediately for these patients. So remember that these triage categories are not set in stone. They are constantly changing. So a patient can either deteriorate and get worse. So someone who was an initial orange can simply become a red. Or someone who was a green can become an orange. Or they can better. They can get better. Someone who was a red becomes an orange. Someone who was an orange becomes a green. So to achieve this, the, all the clinicians must be involved in the pathway should be rapidly assessing these patients by priority. Even when they encounter the patients after they have been treated, assess and triage is a continuous thing that keeps going on. And remember that changes in priority must be noted and the appropriate actions must be taken. For those that have non-urgent cases, we want to proceed with the assessment and further treatment according to the patient's need and once the immediate and urgent patients have been stabilized. So you don't want to keep seeing a patient that's a green when you have patients that are red or patients that are orange that are waiting by. That's why whenever you get any new patients coming in, quickly get their vitals, ask what they have come for, and then you are able to triage these patients and see who you are going to be attending to first, who you are going to be attending to next. So here's the question of our question of the day. So you're on call and you have four patients referred to you. One, that's a G4 para 3 at term, fully dilated with fetal distress. Two is a 24-year-old woman with a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Three is a 65-year-old woman with a CS cervix that's actively bleeding. And four is a PG at 36 weeks with uterine rupture. So the first question is, whom do you see first and why? The second question is, what order will you attend to these patients? So you may pause the video at this particular moment, having 
listened to this lecture so that I can give you time to actually answer this question. And here comes the answer. So here's the background. So generally our biggest risk with these patients is going to be lying between saving the patient that has the ruptured ectopic pregnancy and the patient that has the uterine rupture. So remember that in our setting, most cases were going to be uh, of mortality are going to be due to ectopic pregnancies because we generally have a higher incidence of the ectopic pregnancies than we do of uterine ruptures because we see the ectopic pregnancies more often than uterine ruptures. So the question also is going to be largely dependent on certain other factors that are going to be surrounding the patients and certain other things that are going to be present in the history. So what exactly do I mean? Number one, if the woman that actually has come in with the uterine rupture has a live fetus, remember that here there is a risk of losing both the fetus, there is a risk of losing the mother. If you save the fetus, there is also a higher risk if you don't intervene in time of losing the uterus, of having a hysterectomy. So this patient actually has a higher risk of losing both the mother, the child, and also a higher risk of hysterectomy. So even if you manage to save the mother, they may still have a hysterectomy. So this woman that, and remember also keep in mind, this woman has not yet given birth. She's a prime gravita. She doesn't have any child. Imagine a situation where you have a possibility to save this child and save the mother, then you delay and then you end up losing the child, having a hysterectomy and you save the mother. It means that you have already created a nightmare for this woman. And also not enough information is actually given to us in the question to conclude that the woman that has come in with an ectopic pregnancy has been pregnant before or if they are in shock or if they are hemodynamically stable or hemodynamically unstable. So as such, with the woman with the ruptured uh, uterus, with the life fetus, we want to first treat that patient first while we try and hemodynamically stabilize this other patient with a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. The second thing that you want to note is that if the prime gravida that has the uterine rupture has a dead fetus, you still may be able to buy some time through, the, though there's going to be a higher risk of this patient having a hysterectomy compared to that one that has a ruptured ectopic pregnancy because it may just affect one of the tubes. And the worst case scenario is it may have this extensive damage or continuous bleeding that may result in a hysterectomy, but not as high compared to the uterine rupture. Then with the woman that's actually actively bleeding from the CS cervix, this one has a higher chance of actually getting into shock. And remember, this is a woman that's 65 years old. She's quite older than all the patient and quite frail. Remember what we said at the very beginning. We want to prioritize the pregnant women, but of course, this shouldn't be at risk of other patients that are in danger. So remember, this patient is at risk of dying if she keeps bleeding, as compared to the woman that's fully dilated and in fetal distress. Remember that with the fetal distress, it's generally just going to be affecting the fetus. And in most cases, they may actually deliver using your assisted instrumental deliveries. And this may actually even be conducted by an experienced personnel such as a midwife. So you may not necessarily need to be there in that particular case. So as such, the patient can actually be the patient that has the fully dilated cervix and they have fetal distress. They can be seen last. And remember that the primary goal is to save the life of the mother first. So if you're in a place where resources are available, like you guys were commenting on that same post on the community tab, then you want to save both the patients that has the ruptured ectopic pregnancy and the patient with the uterine rupture. But the order in which you're going to be attending to these patients, I would generally want to attend to the uterine rupture first, followed by the ectopic pregnancy, followed by the bleeding CA cervix, then the woman that's in fetal distress. But of course, in an ideal setup, all these patients must be seen at the same time. And though, even if you have some limited resources, make sure that both patients D and B, meaning those that have a uterine rupture and those that will have ectopic pregnancy are seen at the same time. But in all these instances, don't forget the primary thing to call for help. You can't do it alone. I really hope you enjoyed this video on triage in obstetrics and gynecology. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.